Hey everybody, my name is Sharon Quinn and I'm also known as the original Runway Diva and you are watching Model Behavior. Class is officially in session. My guest lecturer today is legendary industry icon and pioneer Audrey Smalls. After more than 60 years in the fashion industry, she has created a niche that secures her place as one of fashion's most innovative entrepreneurs. This uh, episode today is part one of a very special two-part episode. Welcome to Model Behavior, Audrey Smalls. Thank you. I am so glad to have you here, but you already know that. Um, I want to talk about, let's, let's go right back to the very beginning, because I only learned this stuff about you by reading your bio. Now, how did you even get started in this, this business at all? At 15, I was already 5'11", 6 feet tall. All right. At 15, much thinner, and that's how I got started in modeling. I, I knew about the Ophelia DeVore School of yes, Charm. Yes, yes. So I went to the Ophelia DeVore School of Charm, and they taught me how to walk, how to sit, how to stand. Uh, they taught you how to make an entrance, how to walk upstairs, uh, color harmony, makeup, hair. You know, they need a school like that I, Oh, I, you get out of my head. I was just about to ask you, ask you if you thought They need that. a charm school yes, now. Well, anyway, that's where I went to the Ophelia DeVore School of Charm. And my very first job that I got paid for mm -hmm. was I was a Say Hey Kid for Willie Mays. Wow. And that was August the 8th, 1954 at the Polo Grounds when it was in New York City and he was with the New York Giants. Wow. And that was a paid assignment. So what, 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 was, what was the say, say hey? Because Willie Mays, when he met you, he said, say hey. Okay. So we were the say hey kids. We were dressed it like uh, people with uh, baseball uniforms on. It was wonderful. Okay. It was just a great. And the young lady who worked with me, we were six of us, Helen uh, Aganov. Well, she's now Helen Hill. But anyway, Helen and I did it together. And we're still the best of friends. I made friends, and I have kept those friends all these years so that's how I got started then I got a job at uh, Bloomingdale's okay now this is uh, 1962 now and Bloomingdale's there was an ad that said they looked for a model salesperson and it was for Christmas help mm -hmm. and so model salesperson I got that job and I used to wear robes because it was the robe department or the loungewear department. Mm -hmm. And I'd stand at the head of an escalator in a robe with a sign with, you know, third floor and the price of the robe. And I would <laughs> take the people off the elevator and sell the robe. <laughs> I sold a lot of robes. So, and, and I, so I was a model sales. I was really a salesperson who got dressed up as a model. They don't do that anymore. I know, but they should. They really should because I sold a lot of robes. <laughs> so, oh, so we're not talking. Okay, I, I'm just curious. We're not talking terry cloth bath. We're talking no lounge like, wear elegant, like okay. elegant robes. Yes, like and an evening robe. Not really, an e but very, very. You know, women don't get dressed like that. No more house dresses. Yeah. Remember, you would come home and you'd change into a house dress or a caftan or something very elegant. Mm -hmm. You know, you just didn't go home and just throw on anything. But okay. so this was the the loungewear department, okay. and so I would wear what well, they would call robes, but they were very nice sleeves, beautiful colors, mm -hmm. beautiful fabrics, and uh, that's how I got. I, that was modeling. Now I, I saw on your bio that you were signed. You were signed with Grace Del Marco. Yes, that's a part of uh, Ophelia DeVore. Ophelia DeVore was a part of Grace Del Marco. So if you went to the charm school, you could then go to Grace Del Marco. And before I got there, Diane Carroll was there, mm -hmm. Diane Johnson, and Cicely Tyson. Oh, wow. And I was very fortunate when I was with Ophelia DeVore that I had Miss Bea Richards of Guess Who's Coming to Dinner. Yes, I know who that was. Miss Bea who Richards she was, was yeah. my instructor. She was the one who taught me how to walk, how to stand, how to talk, how to, how to be, have that savoir faire was incredible. She was so special. Let me, let me ask you this, because I remember those times, even though I was a, I was a young girl, yes, then, but we carried ourselves yeah. with, with so much pride and elegance and grace and class. We were just proud to be black people. What's, going, what's your take on what's My going on today? My take on that is, where has all the elegance gone exactly. in this world? 
the ladies today, one lady told me, in fact, young lady, and she said, you know, Miss Audrey, uh, I don't own pants that have a zipper. So that means she only wears leggings. And leggings are not appropriate for every day. And sometimes her derriere is a little too large for, the, you know, in the street. Leggings are not, you They're know, not for, pants. Okay. <laughs> she didn't own a pair of trousers. So the ladies today, they show off too much cleavage, just too much. I guess they're looking for a man, but the man is not looking for that woman. Something happened when we came along, or not when you came, when I came along, we had gloves on. We were dressed to the nines. We went to work with high heels and, and we got on the subway. Mm -hmm. We looked well, you know, we dressed well. You, you, we didn't wear a dress that was vulgar tight. That's the only way I can say it. Women are showing it all. There's nothing left to your imagination. And what I don't understand now, young people, they have on jeans. Well, jeans have a zipper. The jeans are skin tight, and jeans have two pockets in the back. Why is there a cell phone in, in the that back pocket? pocket? No, no, I'm asking you why. And I asked the few, oh, but it's easy, I can go get it. Okay. I would never put a cell phone in my back pocket, whether it's a pair of jeans. You just don't put a cell phone in your back pocket. Things have happened, and I don't know how it happened, but it happened too fast. Well, I, I got a take on how this has happened, it, it, because these things were passed down. Okay. Like your mom passed this stuff down to you, and you pass it down to others. At some point, and this is, we're only a few generations past, it stopped. Information and knowledge and, and pride and all that stuff stopped getting passed down. So now it's just every man for himself. You know, there's no etiquette. Young people come to me and I talk to them often and I have a group every now and then that comes to my office. I can, can't take more than 12. And I would set up a table so that I wouldn't want to see how they set the table. Mm -hmm. I'd have all the plates, the dishes, everything there, silverware. And they didn't even know how to set a plate. They didn't know how to set a setting. And I said to one young lady, I said, well, how do you eat your dinner every night? She says, on my lap watching television. And I, I almost cried. So I, I live near Tiffany. Mm -hmm. So I took them to Tiffany's. They had never been in a Tiffany's. I took them to the fourth floor so they could see table settings. They said, oh, we've never done anything like this, Miss Audrey. I showed them how to set a table. Yeah, that, mm. Somebody showed me. Absolutely, and I and it's our, well, let me shut up, because I don't have any kids. Well, you but said I, that, I, I have a lot of nieces and nephews. You said class is in session, yes, so here and we I, are. and I try to teach them, and they, you know, you mm. can't learn much if you got your phone and you like this. Yes, they Disconnected the from phone. everything. Well, you know, the, the, another thing, they have a smartphone, but they're not smart. Oh, God. <laughs> They're not smart. Yeah, I said, if you have a smartphone, how come you don't know that? They don't know history. And they're not trying to learn, which is no. what baffles me. Yeah. I don't really guess. Like, so you don't, you don't want to know where your parents' parents came from, who, what you came from, what our people are about, our history that's so lush and, and beautiful and magnificent. You don't want to learn that? And the other thing is, if they're in fashion, oh, I love when they say, oh, you know, Miss Audrey, I'm a designer. Okay. And they, they don't sell the clothes to anybody, so I mean, but they were a designer. And then I would say to them, how long, you know, they went to school for it, and they, I know they're creative, and I would say to them, now, do you know Barry Schwartz? And they said, oh, no, I don't know Barry Schwartz. I said, but you know Calvin Klein? I said, there would be no Calvin Klein if there wasn't a Barry Schwartz. And I'd say, but do you know Pierre Berger? No. Well, there would be no Yves Saint Laurent without a Pierre Berger. Now, do you know Giametti, Giancarlo Giametti? There would be no Valentino. I said, you are the creative end. Where is your business partner? Wow. You can't be a designer and be creative and be your business partner and do everything. You need to surround yourself with people who have that expertise and they don't seem to understand that. But I'm a designer. Oh, I'm a stylist. Do you have any clients? No, I don't have any. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. 
So, but, well, how about the designers who don't sew? Oh, that's a lot of people. Yeah, that's like a that. lot of folks yeah, that yeah. are out here like that. They, they don't know how to sew. It's like, how you a designer and you 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 can't sew a, a garment? Okay. Yeah. So it's it's, it's and you, that takes me. To, I'm, I'm, I didn't mean to cut you off, but that right. takes me to um, Ebony Fashion Fair. Oh. Is that where you, now? I'm, I'm sure all that stuff you just said right. you learned all of that as you were growing up, but you yeah. had to learn. A great deal of that working with uh, Miss Johnson and working on Ebony oh, Fashion Fair. Oh, that was fun. That was 19, you know, I, would, I was with the Ebony Fashion Fair as the commentator from 1970 to 1977. In fact, my 47th anniversary of me leaving Ebony is coming up. The 31st of August in 1977, I left Ebony Magazine. That's 40 years ago. That's I wild. left Ebony Magazine, and people still remember me. And I, I, but I remember you from commentating, it, too. People, so I, I, I learned so much with Eunice Johnson. First of all, we only traveled first class. And in those days, we went TWA nonstop to Rome. That was our first stop, Rome, because it was couture. Mm -hmm. And nonstop, oh, my God. We had about 10 pieces of luggage. We, we carried all our luggage, and we... We, we, we car and driver, Plaza Atene, the Hassler Hotel, the Excelsior Hotel, only the best of the best, Mr. Johnson. And she could write those checks, and we went to all of the wonderful shows, and I got to meet all of the designers, and I got to know who they were. Now, we weren't always invited to everything. That's what I was getting to. And yeah. uh, when we weren't invited, Mrs. Johnson was very shy, and as you know, I'm not shy. Mm -hmm. So it was the 70s, and African-American, black models were the thing. African-American, I mean, American models, mm -hmm. black, were the thing. And I would go backstage with them, and I could get in backstage, and I could see the clothes up close and feel the fabrics and really see it because they didn't invite us. So I got started um, with my company knowing that backstage needed help. I was watching what was going on. And with Mrs. Johnson, I learned to, to uh, well, really drink the best of wines, wow. the Pouilly Fousses, the <laughs> Mont Rachets, you know. <laughs> we only drank white wine because she said red wine will spoil your dress or something like that. <laughs> we only drank white wine. And we, uh, we, we met the most divine uh, designers, and, and we met Yves Saint Laurent, and I would ask the young lady in PR, uh, I'd like to take pictures with and she, of course. So I have pictures with Yves Saint Laurent, Hubert de Givenchy, uh, Jules Francois Carré, all the designers, Valentino, of course, and I would teach people that his last name was Garavani. And I used to love talking about fashion, but I wouldn't talk about, most people say, well, she's wearing so-and-so and so-and-so. Well, you know she's wearing it, she's got it on, so you never have to use that word wearing. And you say, well, the look is a V neckline, it's plunged and it, it's draped and it's shaped and it, it's biased and it moves and, it, and the fabric is. And, and if you know it's Pucci, he only signs Emilio all over. You know, you, you teach people, tell them mm -hmm. what they don't know, and you don't tell them the obvious. Never, you know, just tell them what's not seen. Now, I want you to tell everybody the, the, uh, f the overall effect that Ebony Fashion Fair had on, on black women, uh, on women, but on, on black women in Not particular. Not just black women, black men. Uh, exactly. You know, we on started people. out, I, I wasn't there in the beginning, but I could have been. It was 1958, and the reason why I, I wanted to be a model in 1958 with Ebony Fashion Fair, but I was too tall. The girls then were five six, five five, five four. Mm. You know, we didn't get tall until later on, and you see how tall the girls are today. So it started in 1958, and it started um, in New Orleans, and it was the Flint Goodrich Hospital, and they needed to raise money. It was uh, Frida DeKnight, and Frida DeKnight was the uh, fashion editor and the home editor for Ebony. Mm -hmm. And she did it for approximately, I'd say, six, seven, eight years. And then she passed away. And then Mr. Johnson told his wife, well, you got a job. <laughs> so she had to take it over. And I didn't start with them until 1970. And women in the audience would try to outdress 
us on stage. I mean, women and men. I would see men in pink suits, pink satin <laughs> suits. You could see they got dressed to the nines and they were always in the paper. They enjoyed dressing and they would come to see what was new and they would try to copy it the best way they could. And it was an era that was so different than it is today. You know, you look at the streets today, nobody's dressed up. Nope. You know, the, the basic uniform is a T-shirt, jeans, sneakers, and a baseball cap. Those four pieces. And it's, it's yeah. sad. I don't know who's making money. Somebody must be making well, yeah, money. So, yeah, I don't know what they're making it on. Yeah. But the, the whole dressing up to go to the opera and to the theater. Right. Now, you don't see that anymore. No, I go to the opera quite often, and I see people in jeans going to the opera. They're, I to no, yes, yes. Yeah. And not just black women. This is everyone. This is everybody. And I work at a theater, and I have people calling asking, is there a dress code? And you just tell them yes. Yeah, I'm <laughs> like, no, but you, you probably you want to dress nicely, yeah. I, I would say that. But now, I remember Ebony Fashion Fair, and I remember every time it came, it was a special event. Yeah. You got your tickets way in advance, yes. and then you went and got your, alf your outfit, right. and you actually, you you came there, as the, as the kids say now, to stunt on people. That's right. So you wore your absolute best. But you and I had a conversation be uh, a couple weeks ago on the phone when you confirmed, and you don't think that the thing that was Ebony Fashion Fair, maybe not that production itself, but you don't seem to think that something like that could come back. It's very expensive. That would be millions of dollars. And the bus uh, traveling all over the United States in a Greyhound or a coach bus mm -hmm. with 20, 22 people, putting them up in a uh, hotel, feeding them, buying all those clothes. You know, Eunice Johnson she had to buy bought, them. You did she say that. bought everything. Every now and then, uh, somebody would loan us something, we'd have to return it, but most of everything she bought, we paid for it. I wrote the checks, she signed them. Uh, one year, I, I think I was making $200 a week if I was making 200 and I wrote a check to Valentino for $50,000. Oh my gosh, yes I did. <laughs> <laughs> and she never worried about checking her balance. No, 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 she knew the money was there. Well, that magazines were magazines, and mm -hmm. Mr. Johnson spent a lot of money, and he raised a lot of money. They raised more than $51 million in the, in the span of time that we did it over like 51 years. Mm -hmm. We didn't start out earning that as it grew, and the tickets got to be more expensive, and we raised more money, but it, it's prohibitive. You know what it costs to put on the yes. fashion show now. It's unbelievable. And to try to do one in, in New York City is just bananas. I don't know why there's so many designers showing. They have presentations. They don't want to pay anybody, but they're gonna. it's their ego. It's an ego. But we did educate a lot of people. Uh, in fact, I had to prove once that Ebony Magazine showed Fendi in New York in 1970 because we had a client named Florsheim Shoes. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether you're familiar uh, with Florsheim. Yeah. So we had Fendi was our client. We bought from them as a designer. And Carl Lagerfeld is the designer for Fendi, and he has been all these years. And Fendi had to F two Fs together. And mm -hmm. I proved that Florsheim was trying to use that two Fs, and Fendi was going to sue Florsheim. And I, I was the person who said, well, Florsheim saw it the show because they were part of the show and they saw the two F's from Fendi and they thought they could use the same two F's. So we trained a lot of people and I used to tell, Sears was a part of our show because the advertisers wanted to be a part of the Ebony Fashion Fair so I would, I would have a line something that you know if you can't get to Rome and if you can't get to Paris try Sears and the audience would laugh and I'd have a nice suit on for a gentleman, and the you know, male models were so fabulous, you know. Mm -hmm. And it was a real education, and people used to love to hear what the fabric was. I mean, they didn't know about chiffon, I used to say chiffon, and georgette, and leather, and I would tell them about the different furs, so they just, they just learned so much, and they, they'd come back and say, wow! That was fantastic. You know, they loved the color, and I never told the color because you could see what color it was. Why should, why should <laughs> I tell you it's a red dress? You're looking at it. 
<laughs> now you develop your how did you develop your common commentary style well you know what first of all you have to have a sense of humor mm -hmm. you have to have a good speaking voice and you have to know fashion if you got those three things and then I would always tell people what they didn't see one guy wanted to know well what was the bias and then he said he didn't really care what the bias was he loved it <laughs> when I, <laughs> and then if it was the Stephen Burroughs and I'd tell him about that lettuce hemline and everybody would go to the hemline to see what the hemline, a lettuce hemline. And of course I told you before, uh, I would tell people Valentino's last name. They didn't know Valentino mm -hmm. had a last name. I would say that. Uh, what to wear on Sunday when you don't get home to Monday. <laughs> now, I, now I remember, or I remember auditioning for Ebony Fashion Fair, and I got right down to the wire. Miss Johnson flew me to Chicago. Yes, oh yes. I tried on the, the clothes. They dope for me, though. I really thought I had this job, because the guy was just oh. taking my measurements and trying to call. He said, oh, girl, you got this, you got this. And for whatever reason, oh. Linda, <laughs> I didn't make it. Oh. Um, but it was, it was one of the greatest experiences of my life. Oh. And I remember the Ebony Fashion Fair models were special because they could do tricks. They could yeah. throw up coats and, yeah. and flip them on and take them, stuff that you don't really see. Well, but it, they had enough rehearsals. Okay. <laughs> they might not have done that in Joliet, Illinois, our first show. But by the time they got to New York, they, were, they had rehearsed it and practiced it. You know, like anything, you know, you do it over enough times, you know, you get it right. And I know that, you know, as with everything, for me as a runway model, you put everything in your bag of tricks. You pull it out when yeah. you need it. It seems to me like the art of runway is going the route of like Ebony Fashion Fair, big shows like that. Nobody is honing their skills anymore. How do you feel you know, about that? No, the models that? today, they just walk down the runway and the producers tell them, walk straight ahead, get to the camera, turn, and then go back to up the runway. Nothing, just. And that's not, to me, And that's if not the music the isn't good, and if the model that can't walk, and most models can't walk, yeah. And if you don't like the outfit, then, you know, you could go to sleep. You know, when you were with the Ebony Fashion Fair, honey, we had you moving, the music was going, the models were moving, the clothes were And it didn't really fabulous. matter if you didn't like the garment, though, right? Your, no, your no, job was to it was, sell We it. entertained. You yeah. entertained. And they don't do that now. No, it's very, it's, it's totally different. Okay, now I'm going to segue because you have the ground crew, which is yes. your, your company that handles most, if not all, of the backstage productions um, at New York Fashion Week, correct? Thank you. No, not so much anymore. It's but that, different. But, but I've done it. I've done, you name it, Let's talk 40 about years. One, how, well, you, you, you mentioned that earlier, how you came up with that concept. I came up with that concept because when I was with the Ebony Magazine and we didn't always get to go to see these shows because we didn't get invitations. Mm -hmm. I mean, I had to talk to a lot of people to get invitations. Oh, well, no, you're a magazine. No, we are a magazine. A magazine is a store. We're not a store. We're a magazine, a journal, and we do, if we like your garment, we will buy it and pay for it. We will like a magazine. So that, that concept, no one else has, was doing this. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Johnson came up with that. Mr. Johnson, they wanted those clothes, 85 shows, soon to be 100 and some odd shows. And so when I was backstage, I could see what was going on. And there was confusion back there, chaos, you know, everything was going crazy. So when I started my business, I wanted to produce the whole show for Oscar de la Renta, Bill Blass, all the designers. And they said, oh, no, Audrey, we have our own production people. We don't need you. We know how to put on the show, you know. Well, I got so excited, that, and then I got discouraged. And then I said, well, we know how to dress those models because you have your cousins and your sisters and your whoever. They don't want, they want to see a fashion show. They don't want to be backstage mm -hmm. doing those menial things. And that's how I got started. I wrote out, um, I, I sent letters to 100 people. Uh, I got three replies, and I got one job. And I take that one job with Tick Tanea, was the name of that company, mm -hmm. Abe Schrader's wife, Miquette, uh, and she hired me. And that was when we did it in the showroom. So we had three, four shows a day because there weren't that many people because we didn't get to uh, uh, Bryant Park until 1993, and I got started in 77. So we were doing things at 5.50, 5.30, 
209. We would do it in the showrooms and maybe maybe a small theater. I'm going to stop you right there because you All hear right. the music coming in. Hey, we are just about out of time. I'd like to thank my guest, Audrey Smaltz, for sharing her industry knowledge with us today. Now, before I go, I'd like to leave you with a few thoughts. I want you to, one, remember that you can't change the game until you first learn the game. Two, always surround yourself with positive people and positive things. Three, do what you love and love what you do. And lastly, be who you are, but be who you are tastefully. Always have some class about yourself. Now, don't forget to like us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Pinterest. And if you missed an episode of Model Behavior. Now you can view the previous episodes on our YouTube channel. Just Google Model Behavior with Sharon Quinn and all of the previous episodes will come up. Thanks for watching Model Behavior and I'll see you guys next week. Class is officially dismissed. Bye y'all. <laughs>